Hey everyone, you might have woken up or maybe seen last night some news about Dalvin Cook, some allegations and uh, civil litigation and all that stuff. We're going to go over all of that, going to tell you everything you need to know. That's not the only thing we're going to talk about though, so if you don't want to be bummed out and you just want to talk a little X's and O's, we're going to do that too here on the Locked on Vikings podcast. You are Locked on Vikings, your daily Minnesota Vikings podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. Hey, everybody. Welcome to the Locked on Vikings podcast, part of the Locked on Podcast Network, your team every day. I'm your host, your pal, and the kid you copied off in math class. My name is Luke Braun. You can find me on Twitter at Luke Braun NFL. The show is on Twitter at Locked on Vikings. This episode of Locked on Vikings is brought to you by McDonald's, proudly serving communities since 1965. McDonald's has always been more than just a place to get tasty, affordable food. It's an unofficial community center. And a big thank you to our friends at McDonald's for always being there. I'm loving it. Today on the show... What I really want to talk about, I want to talk about some coverage stuff. I want to talk about Clint Kubiak's play calling, and I want to talk about some players that I thought had standout days against the Ravens, do my whole X's nose thing. This is what we usually do on Wednesdays. However, we got to talk about the Dalvin Cook thing. So if you missed it, there is a situation playing out right now with Dalvin Cook. As I record this, I might have partial information. Um, stuff has kind of been trickling out all night, and more might have trickled out by, by morning by the time you hear this. And the main thing I want to say before I get into any of the actual descriptions of events or anything um, is to not take a side or jump to any conclusions or try to be uh, correct first about the situation. What I see happen all the time is somebody kind of you react to the first thing you see and then you don't want to look like an idiot. So if you see something that contradicts it, that can put you in an uncomfortable situation. And sometimes we respond to that uncomfortable situation by doubling down on the first thing we saw and not necessarily understanding the full like context and detail of the situation. So don't do that. <laughs> Just let information compile. You don't have to have an immediate opinion on anything. That's one thing. But let me compile some information for you. So basically at, oh, call it 8 o'clock or so on Tuesday, Adam Schefter tweeted out that Dalvin Cook was a victim of domestic abuse um, and that there was pending litigation and he cited Dalvin Cook's agent, Zach Hiller. Uh, as that happened, everybody was like, oh, that's horrible. You know, I hope he's OK and all that stuff, as you would if you find out somebody was a victim of domestic abuse. Then more information started to trickle out, and it turned out we kind of had two competing allegations, one from Dalvin Cook and his camp, and one from uh, Sergeant Graceland Trimble. I'm just going to call her Trimble. Trimble uh, alleges that in an altercation at Dalvin Cook's house, Dalvin Cook uh, abused her and committed assault, violence, and stuff, and um, he, she is suing him to the tune of millions of dollars. He calls this or his camp is basically saying that she has been abusive to him for some time, emotionally, history of violence, and all that stuff, and is extorting him. Extortion is the word used by their camp for millions of dollars, right? So that is kind of where we stand right now. So let me tell you about the altercation in question. Of course, there's two sides of the story, so I gotta tell you both of them. As the story goes, Trimble entered Dalvin Cook's home in Invergrove Heights, uh, through the garage, Dalvin Cook's camp says that was with a stolen garage door opener, and that is an important detail because it means there wasn't consent to enter the house. She said she just entered through the garage, um, and she says she was there to break up with him. That conversation didn't go well, and an altercation started. She, at some point, uh, pulled out mace, tried to spray mace at him. She says she unsuccessfully sprayed mace at him, and it actually got turned and sprayed back in her own face. He says... She maced me, she maced my two house guests that were there, uh, and then maced me again, so they both are basically accusing each other of that, um, but suffice to say, there was some sort of altercation, things got physical, and uh, he slammed her into a coffee table, she got a big cut on her face. The wounds that happened there, they look pretty substantial, and she got cut pretty bad on her face. Um, neither party disputes that that part happened, uh, that Dalvin Cook did that to her. Dalvin Cook's and his camp and his lawyer and everybody, their point in this is that he was within his rights to do so. And that might sound a little bit off to you um, because he's claiming self-defense. He's an NFL player and she's five foot five. Like, how can this be self-defense? But I've got a lot of answers to that question. For one, when it comes to situations of domestic violence, especially men who are victims of domestic violence, that is an issue that those people have to deal with a lot. They always have to get the question, how did you get abused by someone that much smaller than you? And look, 
it happens, it can happen, and I'm happy to talk with you more about that if you don't believe me. Dalvin Cook's camp has made a point to kind of point out, hey, you know, history of violence was used, um, that, you know, she was the aggressor, not that Dalvin Cook was the aggressor. Trimble's lawsuit alleges that he, she went in, tried to break up with him, he freaked out and attacked her. Um, so every, that's the he said, she said of this. And that's why I say don't come to any conclusion, don't jump to any conclusions here. What we can talk about is just the kind of legal arena that we are in here. So here is Dalvin Cook's argument um, summed up. Basically, somebody came into my home who I did not want in my home. She's somebody I had a prior relationship with, and she had a history of violence toward me. Um, she attacked me. I fought back. I feared for my safety. In the state of Minnesota, if the those facts are true, of course, huge if, but if those facts are true, that would be legal. And that's essentially his argument is that under self-defense, I'm well within my rights to try to remove somebody from my home. And if you look at the actual like legalese of that particular statute of Minnesota law, um, reasonable force is within your rights if you are trying to remove somebody from trespassing on property you own. And we were in Dalvin Cook's home here. So that could be true. If she was trespassing, that could be totally illegal. And a lot of the other details of the story, who mace to and all that stuff, would kind of not be as relevant there, as long as Dalvin Cook can prove that he was in some sort of reasonable fear for his own safety um, and was trying to remove a trespasser that would not leave, he would be within his rights to use his physicality to do so from a purely legal standpoint. Now, morally, and, you know, did he do the right thing? And is he actually a total jackass? That's all, you know, up to the eye of the beholder, I guess. Um, and a totally different question. I'm just talking about the legality here. And the reason I'm talking about the legality is because, let's be honest, the NFL is probably going to lean a lot on the state of Minnesota's decision to make their decisions when it comes to suspending him or um, fining or, or whatever his availability. And as fans, that's really the only way this is any of our business, right? Like, we don't really have to care about this uh, unless it is starting to, like, affect the futures of the team we root for. Otherwise, these are just two people we've never met. Why would we have to, you know, why should we butt in? So self-defense law changes state to state. Um, essentially in most self-defense situations, you have to try to, you have to have made an attempt to, or determined that you cannot retreat. There is this obligation to try and retreat. You got to try to leave the situation. If you could have run away, you can't shoot the guy. Um, in certain states like Florida, where they have stand your ground laws, you probably have heard a lot about those. That's not true. You don't have to try and retreat before you start to use force. And we're going to talk about deadly force here. We're talking about reasonable force. And what reasonable force means under the law is essentially proportionate to whatever you were threatened with. Um, if you push me, I can't take a baseball bat to your head. Um, and, you know, if some, but if you take a baseball bat to me, I can take a baseball bat to you. That's the kind of idea of reasonable force with like self defense. In a castle doctrine state, which is what Minnesota is, if it's in property you own, you do not have an obligation to try and exit the situation. So that's probably going to come up in these conversations, and it's something that you should probably know about. So Dalvin Cook's camp is going to claim that self-defense argument and then is also going to say all of these other lawsuits and stuff, this is all extortion. You're trying to extort me for millions on a thing that I did not do. And from Trimble's camp, she's going to say, no, you did do it. You attacked me. You were unprovoked. That's going to be a big point of contention. Was he or was he not provoked? Uh, was she or was she not provoked? Who is the aggressor here? That's what it's all going to come down to. I should also mention that Dalvin Cook's camp accuses Trimble of holding everybody at gunpoint. I don't have a ton of detail on that. There's like one video that's very short um, that doesn't have a lot of context where you hear her threaten to pull a gun, but um, that's really all we have, and that's not really enough for me to make a uh, judgment on that quite yet. All of that information is just a pile of info right now. I'm not going to come to any judgments. I'm not going to make any speculations or anything. And I really, really don't think you should either. This is not the time to take a side. This is not the time to say, woe is me as a Vikings fan. Yet another thing. We just got to let it play all out. But you know what? It's a bummer. And I, I got to give you the information, but I don't think any of us want to talk about it any further. So let's talk a little bit more about X's and O's. Um, and what I, what I really wanted to talk about today, and here's what we're going to go through is um, I want to talk about play calling and coverage. I want to talk about Clint Kubiak, and I want to talk about a couple of things with the cornerbacks, especially Chris Boyd, Cameron Dantzler, and a little bit Bashad Breland as well, some of the struggles that they're having. Um, and I want to explain them a little bit better because I, I am never satisfied with just saying player bad, right? Um, so I, I want to get into all of that. The real kind of crux of it all is, A, some of the rules to quarters. So we're going to go real deep on that. 
and also um, how teams try to go deep. I wrote an article at Zone Coverage about all that, um, but really just how do you go deep? How, how do you try to unlock a deep pass? If you just send every receiver deep every single play, you can't force a deep pass, right? The defense will cover that. So you have to kind of find a way to get an opportunity deep that the defense did not cover or, or you know, get, you, you have to unlock those chances. How do you do it? So we'll talk a little bit of that schematically as well. Now, before we get into any of that, I want to talk to you about my new favorite app, it's Get Upside. It is a great way to save a little bit of money at the pump. Gas prices are intense, and Get Upside can save you up to 25 cents a gallon per fill up. That adds up. That's like two, three hundred bucks per month if you drive around a lot. Just go to the Google Play Store or App Store. Download the GetUpside app. That part's free. You sign up. It'll tell you which gas stations are participating that you can go to. Go fill up at those gas stations. Tell them which gas station you went to. It'll process for a day or two, and then money just shows up in your account. You can cash that out whenever you want, however you want. You can do an Amazon gift card or something like that. You can just do PayPal or direct deposit right into a bank account. There's no catch, and you can do cash it out whenever you want. Use the GetUpside app now. You can enter promo code TOUCHDOWN to save uh, up to 50 cents, so 25 cents more per gallon. Double your savings on your first fill-up. Up to 50 cents a gallon off at the pump for the whole fill-up just by get, by using the Get Upside app and entering promo code TOUCHDOWN. Once again, thank you so much for making Locked on Vikings your first listen of the day. The first thing I want to talk about is targets. Justin Jefferson and Adam Thielen. And uh, I want to talk to you about their target share. Now, their target share in this game was lower than I guess you'd want, but it wasn't quite egregious as the catch numbers. They combined for five catches in this game. Now, Adam Thielen was targeted seven times. Five of them fell incomplete for various reasons. Jefferson had a couple fall incomplete. Um, but still... That's a little too low, and we want to, you know, push the field. We want to stretch the defense a little bit more. They're having this check down problem. What's going on? Why aren't they getting the ball to their playmakers and getting these big plays that we know these guys are capable of, right? And to answer that question, we kind of have to think, think like an OC for a second. Think like somebody approaching a defense trying to get that to happen, right? You say, okay, my goal for this game is to get deep, long, explosive plays to Justin Jefferson and Adam Thielen. Pretty good goal. Love it. How do you do it, right? You can't just send them deep and throw to them. It's not that easy. The defense will just cover that. Um, you have to find ways to get opportunities and getting deep opportunities can be a, a pretty difficult thing to do against a defense that knows that's what you want to do. And look, how else are the Vikings going to threaten you either running the ball? And we all know how much people don't like that <laughs> or what CJ Ham? like, come on, what, what are we going to do here? The Vikings are kind of a shot play offense. Now they did the bootlegs. I've been complaining about the bootleg for a long time because I think it's pretty solved. Um, and I, by solved, I mean, defenses know that when you play the Vikings, the Vikings are going to try to throw deep on you and they're going to get to that deep throw by a bootleg. The problem with a deep throw is that it takes a long time to develop a deep throw. If you want a guy to, to catch the ball 30 yards down the field, you got to give him the time to get 30 yards down the field. One way to do that is uh, to block it up with more players, seven, eight blockers, right? We'll talk about that more in a second. But another way to do that is with a bootleg. You play action, uh, you know, a run to the left. And then instead, Kirk Cousins rolls out to the right. And so do all the receivers. They all go to the right. Now Kirk Cousins is nobody in front of him. And he can sit there, read the play and throw deep. That's the, the dream of it. And that's how 2019 worked. Well, it's been a while since 2019 and all those concepts are on tape and te teams know how to defend them. A, they're, you know, sending more guys deep against that kind of thing. They're just using different coverages with more deep defenders. That means guys are double covered. Guys are lurking that are waiting to pick off routes. It has nothing to do with Justin Jefferson's skill or Adam Thielen's skill. Somebody's going to intercept the ball before it even gets to him, right? That has nothing to do with that, but you can't throw that to him. He can't win a contested catch against a lurking defender that's going to undercut the route, right? So there are a bunch of problems with this. One is that teams have figured out that Cousins likes to roll the other way. So whenever there's a run one way, they will send uh, an edge rusher or a linebacker or something on the other side of the field directly at the quarterback. That guy would be chasing down the run play anyways. His job is not particularly important. Um, it makes it a little easier to run against them, and there are ways to punish that, but you're going to get pressure on the quarterback. And if they do end up running and punishing you, well, now they're punishing you with a run play, which is better than punishing you with a deep pass. So defenses are just going to take that every time. They're just going to keep doing this. Um, there are a lot of ways to try to get around that or to solve it, um, ways to try and, you know, subvert that. But basically teams are reading this out. And so you don't exactly have all that time to, to let those deep routes develop. So the bootleg has kind of become more of a little system play, a slant kind of play, a quick four yards kind of thing. 
Um, and the Vikings know this. They're starting to send Chris Herndon as the deep route instead of Justin Jefferson. Because if you send Justin Jefferson as the deep route on a bootleg, you're never going to get to that deep route, and Justin Jefferson's never going to get targeted. So if you want him to get targeted, you, you got to make him the medium or maybe even the short route because that's the guy who's going to get up the ball 99% of the time with the way that defenses are playing bootlegs. It's a problem. So the other way that the Vikings try to get to shot plays is by having extra blockers. You have more guys, you can block more guys, right? The problem with that is it takes guys out of the formation, right? Takes guys out of the route concept. If you have two extra, if you have seven blockers, so that's two extra players blocking, that's two less players running a route. And now you have a three-man route concept. It's a lot harder to do that. And what I don't like about Clint Kubiak, like seven-man protections are everywhere in the NFL. It's not not an option. You can get open with three players. You can have three-player concepts. Clint Kubiak is not having those three players run in conjunction very well to me. Sometimes there will be a two-man concept on one side side and an isolated route on the other side, or they all have these long, developing crossing routes across the field. That was the last play of uh, the last third and nine of overtime, the last play the Vikings had the ball in overtime against the Ravens, and it doesn't work. It's too easy to defend. Those deep routes are not gaining separation Not necessarily because of the routes, though I don't love the routes. And yeah, I am critiquing Adam Thielen and Justin Jefferson. I do think those two guys take some of the blame for this. They aren't running as well. But it's also kind of hard because they're running into double coverages a lot of the time, too. And then it doesn't matter if they ran a good route or not anyways. So I don't like the play designs. I don't like that they keep seven guys or maybe even eight guys in protection, send one dude out into the teeth of the defense, and they only have to cover one guy so they can do that. And then eventually your eight man protection falls apart because you can only block it up for so long. And I also think the lack of like variety in ideas is contributing to this as well. And all of this is Clint Kubiak not adapting, right? If a team shows you cover one, in tape all day, and then they give you cover one to open the game. You have all your good cover one beaters uh, planned. You know, they you you saw cover one, you planned for cover one, and then they go, man, oh, they're super prepared for cover one. Let's switch to cover two. And now everything falls apart because you didn't ha- like anticipate that they were going to switch their coverages when you show that you have them figured out. That kind of thing has happened a lot in these games. And that's kind of why the Vikings offense seems to, to go so well on the scripted plays then fall apart. And the other thing, the scripted plays often have this sort of really well thought out setup and knockdown, you know, we'll run one concept early in the drive and then we'll run a concept that looks like that, but is actually something else later in the drive. And that's all very good, but they don't have more of those. They only have like one or two of those things a game. And that's not enough to get you through the game. When Stefanski was here, he was doing that constantly. He was so good at layering one thing into the next and making one play look like the last play. And then the next play looks like the first play and and everything was so good at that and I think Gary Kubiak was very good at that as well Glenn Kubiak just does not have that talent and and that's really unfortunate because I don't know if anybody in the room has that talent and I don't think the Vikings are going to have this all year and it's part of why I'm kind of over the 2021 Vikings until they prove to me that they can run a real offense that has 60 minutes worth of juice in it I wrote an article at zone coverage about this Um, you can find it at zonecoverage.com You can find all that stuff there. Um, But I also want to talk a little bit about the defense. So let me get into that. But first, let me talk to you about the best tasting protein bar on the planet. It's eating season. It is Thanksgiving season. And that means we are going to stuff our big old faces with too many calories on one day. And unless you want to feel like crap for all of that, maybe you should uh, turn to a built bar instead of a dessert. And maybe that leftover slice of pie that's like 300 calories is not preferable to to a built bar that's like 130 and still satisfies the craving. It's all covered in 100% chocolate, comes in delicious flavors. Uh, you know, coconut cream pie, how about a coconut built bar? Raspberry tart or something like that, how about a raspberry chocolate built bar instead? High protein, high fiber, low calorie, low sugar. They will satisfy that nasty craving, but they're not going to knock you off the wagon. And we all know we need some help this time of year. So head on over to built.com. They also have limited flavors. Every three or four days, they uh, will introduce a new limited time flavor. Be on that. I believe right now is coconut brownie chunk. And that is red alert. Defcon one. You got to get in on that. That is the best flavor. And at built.com, you enter promo code LOCKED15, you can get 15% off of that order as well. That's promo code LOCKED15, L-O-C-K-E-D-1-5, at built.com. I want to talk to you quickly about defense. Um, First off, the defensive line had a cool game. I got to highlight Kenny Willekes, who had an awesome game. I also have to highlight uh, James Lynch, who has very sneaky good plays. (laughs) It's very hard to find them, but then when you do, you're like, oh, wow, that was a really good play. 
um, these rotational guys, these rookies from last year that we kind of wrote off that are coming back and doing something. It's really cool, and I just want to highlight it. Um, maybe we'll talk about it in more depth another time if we can. Um, I also want to highlight back on the offense, I want to just talk quickly about Mason Cole. I know he had a better PFF grade um, and than like Bradbury's had, and a lot of people want to bench Bradbury for him. I'm contractually obligated to say that's not a good idea because Mason Cole was hidden a lot. He did a lot more double teaming. He did not do very many difficult assignments and run or pass. When he did, it did not go well nearly as often. The Vikings hid their backup center, and that's what you would expect them to do. That's wise to do, but we should probably adjust our... Uh, our evaluation of him for that. And I know that PFF's grading system does not do that. So keep, bear that in mind. But really what I want to talk about is the cornerbacks, Dantzler, Breland, Boyd. Um, these guys are struggling, right? And I think a big struggle that they're having, and I've talked about this before, they play too far off. They play really soft coverage. They're kind of scared. Another part of that is slow reads. And I'm getting to know the reads a little better. And it, this might even have to be an off-season conversation because it's really difficult to learn like cover four. But the Vikings run a lot of cover four or quarters. And quarters, the way it works now, is not just a deep defense, right? It has a lot of reads and calls. And there's a lot of Nick Saban type stuff where if he zigs, you zag kind of um, calls and adjustments and stuff that are all made on the fly. And it's very complicated. And so it's hard for me to learn. Um, but once you kind of see what people are doing, you can see, oh, he read that right, but was just a little slow. That's why it was a completion. There's a um, one concept that is maybe good to start thinking about is instead of thinking X, Y, Z for the receiver or outside receiver, slot receiver, tight end, um, think of them as numbers. Count from the outside in one, two, three, and then you get to the ball and then you cross the ball and you count back out three, two, one or two, one or whatever it is. Um, and think about it that way and then watch the cornerbacks with that in mind. Are they taking the one or the two? A lot of times in match defenses like what the Vikings run, somebody's job will be the number one. That doesn't mean the number one receiver is the Devontae Adams. That means the guy on the furthest outside. And if that changes, let's say the outside receiver runs a slant and somebody else runs a flat, you pass it off and it looks like zone and then you play man-to-man -man technique from there. Um, but sometimes that means, you know, depending on the route concept, there was one play, it was a first down to Mark Andrews, where, where Cameron Dantzler's assignment was to read it um, one to two. And that means you you cover the one, and if he does a certain thing, and then the two does a certain thing, and Mark Andrews was the two on the play, then you move to the two. So you have everything vertical that the one does, but if the one goes vertical past you, and then the two breaks out in what would be like a, a sale concept, maybe with, you know, one, the, the outside receiver runs a go route and the tight end runs a corner route, right? Which is what that was. Um, if that happens, the second that tight end breaks outward, you are now on the number two and the safety's job is to pick up the number one behind you. And he was late to make that read and it was a catch for a first down. That kind of stuff, that really complicated stuff is what we need to expect from our cornerbacks, and it's what they're not doing right now. I want to explain this in more depth a time when I have more time to do that, so put a pin in it, um, because this, this coverage stuff is really interesting to me, but you can start to see the mistakes kind of show themselves if you can start to understand the ins and outs of the coverages the Vikings call. And they're not all that complex. Sometimes they just call straight to st straight, you know, man-to-man -man coverage, cover one. And I think they should stop doing that because they don't have the guys to cover man-to-man -man like that. That kind of stuff where they, they, they understand it, but it's just a little slow. And only the elite guys read everything exactly quickly. You got to be kind of forgiving when you get this granular into tape. Um, because, you know, you, you get that detail oriented, you're going to find all sorts of little nitpicky mistakes and don't convince yourself that eight nitpicky mistakes means a bad game. Eight big mistakes means a bad game. But when we start nitpicking more, we learn a little bit more, but we also start to find more bad things and don't accidentally talk yourself into being a total hater, right? If I were to levy a criticism that you can take to the office and tell people without having to explain to them, you know, sit them down and explain to them match quarters for six months, it would be they are reading things correctly but they are still a little slow in doing it. They're not busting coverages anymore, but they're still a little slow in doing it. And part of that is, you know, being new to the scheme. Bashad Breland's never done this before. Part of that's being young like Cameron Dantzler. Chris Boyd has no excuse. Uh, Chris Boyd's just bad at the sport and probably shouldn't be on a roster. <laughs> I'm, I'm pretty over Chris Boyd. He had a terrible game against Baltimore. 
I, I really want to talk more about all of this, and and we will another time. I promise you. So so put a pin in it. Um, but tomorrow we we got to move on to the Chargers. Tomorrow is is crossover Thursday. We're going to talk to uh the the Locked On Chargers guys. So um really excited about that. This should be a really fun game. I'll be at it. So I should hopefully be able to report f- report from the the bird's eye view of the cheap seats. <laughs> uh so that'll be all really fun thank you so much for making locked on vikings your first listen for your second listen check out the peacock and williamson podcast they will be talking about all the crazy things they'll probably talk a little bit about dalvin cook probably talk a little bit about aaron Rodgers, whatever else is going on in the nfl so check that out i'll see y'all tomorrow and as always skull